everybody. Breaking from overnight now, a big victory for the Trump team at the Supreme Court on the travel ban. Those justices allowing the current version to go into full effect, at least temporarily, but the battle could be far from over. For now, 7 2 decision. Good morning. I'm Bill Hemmer, live inside of America's newsroom. How are you doing? Good. I'm doing all right, <laughs> nice Bill. Good morning. Good to see you. I'm Sandra Smith. Seven of the nine justices agreed to allow the Trump administration to enforce the travel ban. The White House praising the decision, saying, quote, the proclamation is lawful and essential to protecting our homeland. We look forward to presenting a fuller defense of the proclamation. The Trump administration arguing that blocking the full ban, which impacts eight countries, was causing, quote, irreparable harm to national security. So our chief legal correspondent, anchor of Fox News at night, look who it is, Shannon Bream. Good morning to you on the steps. Uh, what does this decision mean right now for the administration? Why don't you start there over the protests in the back? Yeah, listen, Bill, yes, and we do have protests. We'll talk about those coming up. But this could not have been a better decision for the White House after various lower court decisions blocking all the different forms of the travel ban in whole or in part. The Supreme Court has now said travel ban 3.0, that's the one that came out in September, it can move forward being fully enforced while the lower court challenges continue to play out. It is important to note this is not a decision on the merits, meaning the Supreme the Supreme Court's not saying that it finds travel ban 3.0 is completely legal or constitutional, only that the justices will allow it to be enforced for now. Travel ban 3.0 does impact travelers from eight different countries. Now, critics vow that they will keep fighting. That includes the ACLU, saying this, quote, President Trump's anti-Muslim prejudice is no secret. It's unfortunate that the full ban can move forward for now. We continue to stand for freedom, equality, and for those who are unfairly being separated from their loved ones. Justices Ginsburg and Sotomayor both indicated they would not have allowed Travel Point 3.0 to go into effect, Bill. All right, so now what is at stake for the, for the case and for the court now next? Okay, so what you're hearing today are both sides of this uh, argument that the justices will tackle today, balancing the idea of religious freedom against uh, the rights of LGBT couples and others. Uh, it, it pits uh, basically a baker from Colorado. Jack Phillips is his name. Masterpiece Cakes and Bakery is his uh, business. He says he will serve anyone who comes to him, but he will not craft specific items for events or messages he finds in conflict with his Christian faith. In this case, it was same-sex marriage. I serve everybody that comes in, gay, straight, Catholic, Muslim, atheist. I welcome everybody into my shop. I just don't create cakes for every event that's presented to me. So we talked exclusively with a couple at the center of this case, Charlie Craig and David Mullins. They visited Phillips Lakewood, Colorado shop in 2012 before same-sex marriage was legal in that state. They asked him to design a wedding cake for their reception, which was going to be held in Colorado after they were legally married in Massachusetts. Phillips declined to make the cake but offered to sell them ready-made items in the bakery. They say the whole experience was humiliating. You know, it's embarrassing to say, but I cried. We, we teared up. It was a very painful and emotional moment for us. I feel like the moment made us feel helpless. Now both sides of this dispute say they're feeling confident today. They are out in full force. The case will be heard at 10 a.m. Eastern. A decision is expected by June. All right, so what's the noise behind you <laughs> or off to the side? What's that? We do have both sides here. We have those who are advocating on behalf of religious business owners who say, listen, I'm happy to serve anyone. I don't turn anyone away for service, but if you want me to craft something using my artistic skills or specific abilities for your event, that's where I'm going to have to say no if it offends my deeply held religious, genuinely held religious beliefs. Those are the criteria the court will look at. The other side, we have many LGBT uh, rights supporters. Uh, they are rallying here today to say any denial of service is a denial of service. It's discrimination, and this court must not allow it. So we'll see what the nine justices yeah, think. We shall. Nice to see you again, Shannon. You Shannon Bream on the steps of the Supreme Court. Thank you. Fox News alert now. President Trump digging in on tax reform as Republican lawmakers work to meet his Christmas deadline. Vice President Mike Pence will be heading to Capitol Hill today to meet with Senate Republicans. The president weighing in, promising to spread the holiday cheer with massive tax cuts. We're now one huge step closer to delivering to the American people the historic tax relief as a giant present for Christmas. Remember I said we're bringing Christmas back. Christmas is back. Chief White House correspondent John Roberts is live at the White House. A Christmas present for the American people. <laughs> Sounds lovely. John? 
And the president reminding folks there in Utah as well that uh, he is saying Merry Christmas again. He's bringing Christmas back. Uh, the president working the phones today to talk with folks in the Senate and the House about tax reform. He's having lunch today with a small group of Republican senators, uh, Senator Lamar Alexander, Tennessee, Cory Gardner of Colorado, bringing over a handful of people who wanted to talk face to face with the president about a number of different issues. This uh, lunch will not be specific to tax reform, though I am told tax reform will definitely be part of the agenda. The White House cautiously enthusiastic about how things are being uh, uh, are, are progressing in the uh, Senate and in the House. Senate conferees being appointed today. The White House hoping to limit the scope of the conference that reconciles the House and the Senate versions of the bill to try to make everything as expedient as possible. Some areas, let's put them up on the screen for you here, where there is more work to be done. Small business taxes, the so-called pass-throughs, uh, move to get the Senate bill closer to the House bill. Also more work to do on the state and local tax deduction. Some members looking for more flexibility, I'm told, and how the deduction can be applied. Both bills currently cap the deduction at 10K. No push to change that just to add more flexibility to it. The White House also wants to fix the AMT. The Senate bill did not repeal the AMT. That was kind of a last minute pay uh, for that they thought that they could fix in the conference committee. Don't forget, the president paid $31 million in AMT according to that leaked 2005 tax return. In Alabama politics, and this is pretty big, the president yesterday uh, took the controversial step of giving full-throated endorsement to Republican candidate Roy Moore. The president called Moore from Air Force One yesterday as he was headed to Utah to give him his support, finished the call by saying, quote, go get him, Roy. Now, the White House won't say whether or not the president will do any campaign events for Moore. He does have an event in Pensacola on Friday. Pensacola very close to the Florida-Alabama border, and Pensacola reaches into the uh, Mobile, Alabama market. So it's possible that there could be something for Roy Moore in that. The Republican National Committee also re-upping with Moore. Uh, the decision was made that since he's not dropping out, they can't afford to lose the seat to Doug Jones. So they're back in the game. What might happen to Moore after he is elected, should he be elected, though, Sandra, is another question. Uh, still a lot of questions here at the White House, a lot of debate as to whether or not he will actually be seated in the Senate. We'll see where it goes. It's a week from today. All right, John, and how has the FBI agent Peter Stroke affected the investigation on Russian interference? Well, certainly it's uh, affected the perception, if anything, because we found out yesterday that uh, as part of the investigation, Peter Stroke did interview uh, General Michael Flynn, and now we find out that his role, Stroke's role, in the Clinton email investigation is now under review. That prompted a tweet from the president yesterday in which he said, quote, report anti-Trump FBI agent led Clinton email probe now it all starts to make sense. Stroke has maintained a, a very low profile as an FBI counterintelligence investigator. We don't even have a photo of him. Uh, the Department of Justice Inspector General is reviewing his role in the Clinton email scandal, including reports that he watered down language in the final Comey report, changing the words, quote, grossly negligent to extremely careless. The president took aim at the FBI broadly yesterday, tweeting that its reputation is in tatters, which prompted the current FBI director, Christopher Wray, to send an email to FBI personnel in which he said, quote, I am continually reminded of the breadth and significance of our work and that he is, quote, inspired by example after example of professionalism and dedication to justice demonstrated around the bureau. It is truly an honor to represent you. Wray ended the memo with his favorite maxim, which is keep calm and tackle hard. But certainly we're only just hearing the beginning of all of this as it relates to Peter Stroke, Sandra. Got it. John Roberts live at the White House. Thank you. It's another Thank way you. of saying carry on, right? More now, Byron York, Chief Political Correspondent, Washington Examiner, Fox News contributor. Byron, good morning to you. Good morning, Three Bill. topics quickly now. Does the FBI have a credibility issue now or not? As far as these heavily politicized investigations are concerned, yes, uh, they do. Uh, Peter Stroke seems to be a figure who's popped up in all of these, and uh, not only the Hillary Clinton uh, probe and not only the Mueller probe, but you have to remember the FBI started its investigation, its counterintelligence investigation into the Trump-Russia affair in the summer of last year of 2016, went on for almost a year before Mueller was appointed, and Peter Stroke was part of that, too. So in terms of these politicized uh, investigations, yes. Okay, now on taxes. Nancy Pelosi laid it on the line when she said the following late yesterday. The debate on health care is life-death. This is Armageddon. 
uh, this is a very big deal because you know why? There's really a very hard way to come back from this. Mm. What is the <laughs> concern as this moves to conference? Because apparently Kevin Brady said the Obamacare mandate will be included on the House side as it has been in the Senate side. Yeah, well, I think I think Democrats, as you saw, you don't get much bigger than Armageddon. I think they're in the uh, throw your body in front of this stage of the legislative process. Uh, for re Republicans, there are some big questions that they have to resolve between the House version and the Senate version, a big one being the Obamacare individual mandate. It is eliminated in the Senate version, not in the House version, but uh, you've got to imagine that most mm -hmm. House Republicans are going to like that change. Uh, then there's the number Likely. of tax brackets. You know, there are seven in the uh, Senate version, just four in the House version. There are other differences over the estate tax and tax rates and other things. Uh, all of these differences, though, seem to be bridgeable gaps uh, after the House and the Senate took the big steps of passing their bills. Good deal. Thank you, Byron. Check out your piece on the Logan Act Thank you wrote you, yesterday. Very interesting. Uh, busy Newsday, Senior Counsel of the President, Kellyanne Conway, talks about tax reform and the latest on Michael Flynn and all that coming up next hour here on America's Newsroom. Squeezing like 20 pounds into a... <laughs> Four pound bag today, so that's coming up. Do I even say it's a busy hour. news day nope, anymore? No, we're it's done just, with that. <laughs> it's every day. All right, well, breaking overnight, a police officer shot dead after an ambush style attack. What we are now learning about the suspect. Plus, the UN trying to reach out directly to Kim Jong un, sending a top official to Pyongyang. Former UN Ambassador John Bolton weighs in on that. Plus, there's this. They were talking about collusion this time six months ago, but there's no evidence of that, so now they pivoted to obstruction of justice. President Trump's attorney sparking a debate about obstruction of justice as the special counsel investigation appears to pivot in a new direction. We'll talk about this as we learn more about the role of that anti-Trump FBI agent with Alan Dershowitz. The swamp is sicker, more corrupt, more dishonest than we thought it was. So we just have to dig deeper, throw the rascals out. We have to recognize the election of 2018 is going to be truly historic because it's going to be between a radical left that is stunningly corrupt and the rest of us. People have the right to assume the people that are investigating them are objective and have not already made up their minds. That's why we need to see the text and we need to interview this special agent. But the bureaus had a really bad last 18 months. And, and, and this, um, this makes it worse, frankly. Well, Trey Gowdy with Brent last night on the questions surrounding the FBI. As we learn now, several months later, the FBI agent fired from the special counsel matter after sending anti-Trump text messages. That agent was one of several who oversaw the, the interview of Michael Flynn. We now know he was also the same agent who convinced then FBI Director James Comey to alter the final language in the Clinton email exoneration from grossly negligent to extremely careless. How big a deal is all of this? Harvard Law Professor Alan Dershowitz with me out of Florida. Sir, good day. Good morning to you. Wall Street Journal good editorial. Morning. Here's the headline. The special counsel is stonewalling Congress and protecting the FBI. To you, sir, do you believe there is a conflict of interest here on behalf of Robert Mueller? Well, I think there was a conflict on the part of the FBI agent. He should have recused himself immediately. He knew before anybody that he had sent these tweets. He knew before anybody that he had a bias. I do not believe that it was he who made the decision to ultimately change the accusation against Hillary Clinton from gross negligence to whatever extreme carelessness. That was obviously a decision that had to be approved and made by uh, Comey himself. Uh, so I do let, think let there's a right there. credibility in, issue, but in Comey view, did the right thing. Yeah, as soon as he found view, out about it, as far as we know, yeah. in the summer, he took him off the case. I think he should have been more transparent about it and made that public. But on balance, I don't think this really reflects badly on the entire FBI or on the entire investigation. I have problems with the investigation independent of that. But I think Comey ultimately, I think uh, ultimately Mueller did the right thing. Okay, a bit of a connection here issue here, uh, hearing me, but I, I apologize for walking over you that last point there. But uh, you're, you're good, you're good. I know you're coming on Skype. Uh, you wrote a piece about why did Flynn lie, and I'm not here to ask you to answer that. 
Um, the obvious answer is you think you're doing something wrong and therefore you don't tell the truth. Uh, the, the more important point I think you make in the piece is that the fact that he was charged with lying is a sign of weakness on behalf of the special counsel. Now, why do yeah. you make that point? Well, I think when the special counsel wants to indict somebody and make him into a cooperator, the last thing they want to do is indict him for lying because it makes it clear that you can't trust this guy. Uh, if he had anything better, he would have indicted him for some kind of a conspiracy that involved other people. The way Nixon, for example,'s people were indicted and he was named as an unindicted co-conspirator. So I think if they had anything beyond Flynn himself lying and why he lied, we don't know, because he lied about something that was entirely lawful, uh, it doesn't show strength when you go after your main witness and call him a liar. Mm. John Dowd, the president's attorney, apparently is the one who drafted that tweet from over the weekend saying that the president cannot be charged with obstruction of justice because he is the highest lawmaker in the land. You sent a tweet late last night clarifying your position. Here's what you said. Let me be clear. A president can be charged with obstruction if he commits criminal acts beyond his constitutionally authorized acts. Nixon told aides to lie to the FBI, pay hush money, and destroy evidence. So where are you today now? on this argument. Is the White House building a defense um, publicly at this point? I never had to clarify anything because I've always made the same point from day one. A president can be charged with obstruction of justice if he goes beyond his Article II constitutional authority. That authority includes pardoning anybody and firing anybody in the executive. But if the president were to tell somebody to lie, as Nixon did, or pay hush money to witnesses, or destroy evidence, that, of course, is an independent basis outside of Article II for charging a president with obstruction of justice. So nobody is above the law. Senators can't be charged for doing what they do on the way to the Senate. Judges can't be charged. Each one of the three branches has limited immunity from prosecution for performing there are Article 1, 2, and 3 functions. Uh -huh. uh, last question, need a quick answer. Do you believe the White House is now setting up a public defense in the messaging? Yes or no? I do, of course. And uh, why not? Uh, uh, President Clinton set up a public defense. Uh, a public defense is perfectly appropriate because this case is being tried in the court of public opinion. And if there were to be, for example, an impeachment, that's a political act. So it's perfectly appropriate to use political means to attack political mm -hmm. prosecutions. Hope you come on back. Alan Dershowitz, thank you for your time and the connection there from Florida. Thank you, sir. Thank you. you bet. 21. We are awaiting an announcement this morning from Democratic Congressman John Conyers on his political future as yet another woman comes forward with sexual misconduct allegations against him. Plus this. Just days after North Korea's latest missile launch, the United Nations political chief is heading to Pyongyang for a rare four-day visit amid heightened tensions between the regime and the U.S. Let's bring in John Bolton, former U.S. ambassador to the U.N. and Fox News contributor. What can you tell us about this visit? I mean, how, how unusual is this? Well, I think what's particularly unusual about it is that it's an American who's the Undersecretary General for Political Affairs. Uh, Jeff Feltman, a, a career foreign service officer, uh, former U.S. ambassador to Lebanon, uh, has been in this position for a number of years. So if the U.N. Secretary General thinks there's any chance that Kim Jong-un and the North Korean regime have anything to say, as time gets very, very short here before for a key decision point, they may think saying it to an American is the is the best place to uh, to give it to get back to the White House. You have to think this is a, this is a rather long trip. I mean, is it, you're talking about a four day trip here. The UN spokesperson said uh, it's not in his current schedule to meet with Kim Jong Un, but he did not rule it out. Do you think that's a possibility he could be actually meeting yeah, with the leader of North Korea? Absolutely. In many countries, they don't ever say for sure you're going to meet with the numero uno until it actually happens. Happens, but but that prospect is there. I don't anticipate that North Korea is really going to have anything new and different to say. They may try and see it as a propaganda vehicle, but uh, it'll be interesting to see how it plays so out. So for his part, on his way over here, the U.N. chief, what do you think that he is going hoping to accomplish, not knowing their agenda? 
Well, I don't know what communication the State Department may have had with him, but uh, I know Jeff Feltman. I think he's a responsible person, and I think uh, looking at, the, at what we have been saying, what the H.R. McMaster said out at the Reagan Defense Forum, what the President himself has said, uh, that Kim Jong-un better appreciate that uh, Barack Obama is no longer president and the possibility of American use of military force against North Korea's nuclear capability is real. This is obviously coming amid heightened tensions between the U.S. and North Korea. How is the, the president's strategy working? Obviously, we've been reporting on the, um, the words exchanged, the rhetoric between the two world leaders. How is his strategy playing out in your view? Well, I think he had uh, a very bad hand he was dealt with when he came into office on North Korea, on the Iranian nuclear program while we're on the subject uh, because of 25 years of failure to stop both of those countries from getting across the finish line to having deliverable nuclear weapons. So I think President Trump saw that if there is a peaceful way out here, it comes in China using its unique leverage over North Korea. I think he made that point to Xi Jinping in Beijing. I have to say there's no evidence the Chinese have gotten the message. So I think you're getting very close to a binary decision. Either we leave North Korea with nuclear weapons, which I personally find unacceptable, or we've got to look at military force. But to your point, when you sat down here, the clock is ticking. Time is running out. What, is that? what does uh, the timing of all this look like to you? Well, from all that we can see, North Korea is very close to a point where they can deliver thermonuclear weapons to any target they want in the mm -hmm. continental United States. Obviously, once they actually achieve that point, the odds of us doing anything militarily approach zero mm. because of the risk of retaliation against us. So there isn't a lot of time to fool around here. There's not much of a margin of error if we're going to use military force. And if we don't, then you have a North Korea that can extort and blackmail the United States and sell these technologies wow. around the world. And a big meeting coming up between that U.N. chief and uh, leaders in North Korea. Ambassador John Bolton, always good to see good you. To see Thank you. you for being here. Bill? Hi. Uh, <clears throat> they don't come easy on Capitol. I thought that was an alert there. Right? <laughs> Thank you. A conservative bloc of Republicans pumping the brakes on the current version of tax reform. I don't want this to, to be misconstrued as to saying that the Senate bill is perfect. We need to make sure that all Americans uh, get the same kind of relief. Well, but the bill moved to the next step, so what does that mean for the tax battle? John Barrasso, Republican senator, is here to answer all that. Coming up next, Andrew. We look forward to talking to him, plus a massive wildfire spreading overnight, forcing tens of thousands of people from their homes. We are live near the scene with the latest. My son is a firefighter, and um, I'm not going to wait around for somebody to have to come rescue me, so I'm out of here. <laughs> Members of the conservative House Freedom Caucus nearly derailing last night's vote to conference with the Senate on tax reform, effectively holding the vote hostage until they were promised a bigger role in crafting the GOP's spending strategy in the form of negotiators. Joining me now is Republican Senator John Barrasso of Wyoming, chairman of the Senate Republican Pol uh, Policy Committee. Chairman, thank you for joining us this morning. Things took a dramatic turn on the House floor last night. Was anybody expecting this, or did anybody see this coming? Well, thanks for having me, Sandra. Look, we're beyond that. Uh, there's agreement. We need to do tax reform, tax relief, tax reductions. We are unified on that. And we all believe in lower spending, fewer regulations. So I'm with the Freedom Caucus and what their concerns are about how much money the government spends and wastes. We need to get tax reform done, get it to the president's desk, and provide for the American people the relief that they have been looking for and they voted for a year ago when we elected Donald Trump president. You know, Senator, I, we've obviously, obviously moved beyond that in the form of the vote. Conservatives eventually uh, relented and they approved what they thought had been a formality to start off the evening. But Politico sort of asked the question this morning, does this underscore the divisions within the GOP over a spending strategy? And that is an important question because you wonder if this is something that could derail the momentum behind overhauling the tax code. 
Well, it's important that we do and follow, I believe, Ronald Reagan's approach, which is we want to get the whole loaf. If you can't get it, you take it a slice at a time. And we need to get to the point where we let people keep more of their hard-earned money and get the economy growing even better. So I think we're working together to that. And that's what people want, a strong and healthy economy. That's what they voted for, and that's what Republicans are committed to delivering. How do you diffuse these government funding battles, though, four days to go until this, less than that now, until this, till this deadline Friday. How do you defuse those battles so that so Republicans can move forward on tax reform? Well, part of it is you actually grow the economy. You make the pie bigger, not just how do you slice up the pie. So I think there's a bit always wasteful government spending. We need to eliminate that. But you give people more freedom with fewer regulations. And, and to me, it's lower taxes and letting people keep more of their hard-earned money. I always come on the side of, of lower taxes. So we're going to work our way through this. We have a bill that has passed the House and the Senate. And the Freedom Caucus, Mark Meadows, the other day said, hey, we're 90 percent there. I think we're not very far apart in terms of the tax relief. This is a once in a generation opportunity that we have now to get tax relief for the American people. It's the change they voted for. It's time for us to deliver. Well, that was Mark Meadows several days ago before uh, things unfolded on the House floor last night. So it'll be interesting if we can uh, get his take on things mm -hmm. going forward. Meantime, Democrats not shy in letting us know what they think and their criticism of this GOP uh, bill, calling, it, calling the tax bill Armageddon. Listen to Nancy Pelosi. The debate on health care is life death. This is Armageddon. Uh, this is a very big deal because you know why? There's really a very hard way to come back from this. What did you think of Nancy Pelosi declaring this GOP bill the end of the world? I mean, to me, this is classic Nancy Pelosi. This statement to me seems unhinged. But the fundamental difference between me and Nancy Pelosi is she runs for office to put policies in place to grow the government. And I run for office to put policies in place to grow the economy, a strong and healthy economy, to let people keep more of their own hard-earned money, let people make decisions, not government decide and dictate to us. So to her, this may feel like Armageddon. To me, it feels much more like freedom. All right, and you've got the Senate Republican policy lunch happening today with the vice president. A quick preview. I've got a few seconds left. Well, it's our opportunity to talk again about the success of the administration in terms of regulatory relief that has allowed for us to now have two million new jobs since mm -hmm. Donald Trump became president, be since he was elected president, since mm -hmm. Election Day, because there was an a, a sense of optimism and confidence that came with us on Election Day. Mm -hmm. Two million new jobs, consumer confidence at an all-time high. The next move is tax relief for the American people, That All the right. two twin pillars of growing the economy regulatory relief and tax relief. All right, Senator Barrasso, thanks for your time this morning. Thank you, Sandra. All right, and coming up on the next hour of America's Newsroom, Kellyanne Conway will be joining us, President Trump's senior counselor uh, to the president. She'll be joining in to weigh in on all mm -hmm. of this and her take on, on this morning. Let's just start with this morning. So much going on. Yeah, we've got a, we have a scroll of questions. It's not a list, it's a scroll. <laughs> uh, that's coming up. A okay, lot. from last night. Monday. What we now know is the swamp is sicker, more corrupt, more dishonest than we thought it was. So we just have to dig deeper, throw the rascals out. We have to recognize the election of 2018 is going to be truly historic because it's going to be between a radical left that is stunningly corrupt and the rest of us. House Speaker Newt Gingrich not mincing words slamming Washington culture amid claims of a double standard of the FBI's handling the Clinton email pro versus the Michael Flynn indictment, among other issues. Adrian Elrod, former director of strategic communications for Hillary Clinton, Rich Lowry, editor of the National Review and a Fox News contributor. And boy, we've got a debate here, folks, huh? Uh, what, what the speaker's arguing to both of you, and Rich, I'll let you start on this one is that if you're on the right team, you get the right protection. Is that the story that's developing now, or is it too soon for that? I don't know about that. It's certainly true that James Comey wanted to give Hillary Clinton a pass for her email setup because he thought it would have been too politically explosive, and he didn't want to make that call. So he did everything he could to look the other way. Now, Robert Mueller, I'm sure, does not particularly like Donald Trump. He's acting the way special counsels always do. They're extremely focused. They don't have anything else to distract them with, and they are focused on indicting people no matter what in their specific case. But look, Michael Flynn 
This isn't an indictment he's fighting in court. He has admitted that he lied to FBI agents for whatever reason about these calls during the transition, which, as far as I'm concerned, were totally above board. Well, I, I think his bigger point, Rich, is that Hillary Clinton had 33,000 emails that went missing. She had a server outside the State Department. Uh, the Comey interview apparently was not under oath. Those are the points he was making. Right, about but the she did, Bill, just one addendum here. She paid a big political price for that. She is not president of the United States. And that email exactly. set up and her dishonesty about it played a big role in that. Adrienne, what is your view on that then? I heard you say exactly. Go. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, the, the, the mere accusation that James Comey uh, was, was in cahoots in any way, shape, or form with Secretary Clinton or was on her side, I mean, I agree. I think he absolutely played a major role in costing her the election, especially reopening the investigation into her emails 12 days before uh, the actual election itself. So, first of all, again, it's such an easy target to bring up the Clintons into every single problem that the Republican Party has, which is clearly what Newt Gingrich was doing last night to deflect from some of the real issues. And number two, the big difference, well, there are many big differences, but one of them uh, in, in the, in the uh, investigation in, that Mul Robert Mueller is overseeing now versus what James Comey oversaw with the Clinton emails is that Mike Flynn lied to the FBI. He admitted that. Secretary Clinton yeah, yeah, did we, not. We, so we two, got that. two yeah. huge differences. Yeah, I, I think in a bigger picture to both of you, what is the level of trust that's eroding in these American institutions? Because for a while we've argued back and forth about Congress and other aspects of Washington. Now it's the FBI. And Rich, I bet if you went out and did a poll before stories like these emerged, I think there'd be a pretty high level of trust with the FBI. So what yeah. now? So yeah, I think every institution has seen an erosion of trust, and I think James Comey has a big um, a, a, a had a big role with, uh, with that with the FBI because he didn't play it straight. You know, he just should have called called it as he saw it, and then kicked it up to Loretta Lynch and said, "Look, she's committed a, a crime. It's your decision whether to prosecute or not." Instead, he took it all upon himself and began speaking publicly about the case, and that's why he ends up interfering in the, the election in the final days, because he's, he violated FBI guidelines and talked about it in the first place and then had to uh, so undertake is, a running is commentary that, as events Rich, developed. is that an erosion of public trust? And yeah. does, does it chip away yeah. in and, time? Right, and then on top of it, you know, we live in a very partisan time, so how you see a lot of things depends on where you sit. Now, how do you see that, Adrian? Well, I mean, look, I'm, I'm going to certainly agree that it's, it's a shame that we are seeing such an erosion in public trust, but it certainly doesn't help that the president of the United States is tweeting that the FBI is in tatters. I mean, that's completely irresponsible. We know why he's doing this. He's so fearful of being, uh, of what, what the FBI is looking into, what Special Agent Robert Mueller is looking into, uh, and what the outcome may actually be. We're seeing him in massive panic mode. And for him to go out there and completely disparage some of these government institutions, uh, especially to, to deliver red meat or whatever he's trying to do to his base, is just a real shame coming from the President of the United States. Well, um, according to Gingrich, 2018 is going to be something else. Rich, do you uh, think well, it is? I think 2017 has been something else. I think 2018 will be something else. Talking about 2019 the election, will midterms. be something else. Yeah, look, a, a huge subterranean, maybe not that subterranean issue in the 2018 midterm elections will be whether Donald Trump is impeached by the House of Representatives or not. Because if the Democrats take back the House and with any bit of a comfortable margin, they are very likely to impeach him. Rich, thanks. Adrian, thanks to you as well. More to come on all that. Thank you thanks, Bill. today. Thanks, you bet. Bill. Sandra was Thank next. You. It's hard to believe, but it's been more than two months now since the mass shooting happened in Las Vegas.